still running. <laughs> it's not going to work, but I was going to let it go. Michael, um, good to go. Can you check if on Zoom uh, the visualization is right? Yeah. Can you hear me? Good. What? Right. Can we make a start? Okay. All right. So, um, in uh, the second part, uh, I would like you to you know, to kind of walk a bit more in the shoes of someone who want to try to make this discovery happen, uh, do this type of searches. So we'll be a little bit more technical, but I would like to also offer you a bit, a few more uh, science cases that hopefully will spark your curiosity a bit further. So in particular, uh, I will focus on how to do a stringent discovery using automatic alert filtering. So the point here is that at least for the first part of your searches, you want a computer to do the hard work for you. And then of course, at the end, you can use then your judgment, especially when it comes to triggering follow-up. Although now there are robots that also do that, arguably better than humans. <laughs> so first of all, um, when we talk about searches, more often than not, we're not talking about picking what you like, but more like cutting off what you don't like. And again, we were not talking about in bad sources in absolute terms. You know, uh, this will be somebody else's treasure, but allow me to say not interesting and the expressions of this kind, always keeping in mind what your scientific goal is, okay? First of all, what you want to get rid of instrumental effects. You want to get rid of all these artifacts, <laughs> these bogus, these spurious detections that come quite often, unfortunately, when you do image subtraction. It's really hard to match a new image to an old image. Uh, it's somewhat easier if you're using perhaps Hubble because you don't have atmosphere and all the distortions that it brings along. So you can make a more uh, confident subtraction of the new uh, and the old image. Although you can still have some distortions in the PSF, in the point spread function, depending on the region of the detector where you are at. And also you want to have the images correctly aligned, which also is not necessarily always um, easy to do automatically. So like in this example, I found this software very nice developed by an Australian astronomer that allows you to do this uh, 3D visualization of, uh, of plots and images. Uh, so what I got here is the product of image subtraction, again, using one of my favorite instruments besides ZTF, which is the dark energy camera. This is just a very, small postage stamp around a source here indicated as G, which stands for good, that uh, my pipeline had detected automatically. You can see from, uh, from above that the color of the G source and the B for bad source are different. The bad source is more complex, while the G one is more regular. And if you look in the middle uh, part of the of the figure here, you can see that the uh, good source, the good transient kind of resembles a 3D Gaussian or, or Lorentzian, or whatever function kind of approximates this type of regular shape, that that's the sort of um, shape that you're looking for when you want an astronomical transient to be detected um, and then isolated by image subtraction. The source nearby, however, you can see that has a very uh, pronounced spike in the positive image. So as a residual, as if the flux was in excess in the new image, but it also has this kind of um, stalactite stalagmite, right? It has this part that is in the negative subtraction, like a yin-yang sort of 
uh, image if you look from above, like in the image from the left. So this sort of artifact is extremely common to come across, especially for bright sources. They're very hard to subtract off because of all the nonlinearity effects that you have for um, bright sources, uh, like the brighter fatter effect and other sorts of problems that are accentuated, which is even not perfect alignment is accentuated, made more evident for brighter sources and AGNs, active nuclei or nu bright nuclei of galaxies in general. That's why it's so hard to find transients in the nuclei of galaxies or next to them. And then what you want to do is make sure that you don't end up observing uh, an object that is very close to Earth. It is a, you know, it's an asteroid, it's a, it's a rock. And uh, think that it is indeed the kilonova that you're searching for. And uh, you can be fooled pretty easily because asteroids in some cases don't move fast enough to generate a streak in your image during your exposure. They appear as a point source. And uh, if you don't wait long enough for the source to move, you will not even be able to flag that it is a near earth moving object. So we found that a threshold of typically 15 minutes will allow the source most uh, NEOs to move by more than uh, one or two arcoseconds. So in a, enough for us to be able to visually or automatically say that we are witnessing a moving object um, in, a, in our transient detection pipeline and not a source that is always at the same location, right? Uh, also, asteroids tend to look red. So sometimes what happens, you detect an asteroid and the next image, maybe the transit has moved just a little bit. And if you do force photometry, you detect less flux in the second image because it's moved. So that where you put your PSF for the fitting will not get all the flux. So what you get is a red source like Kilonovi that fades really rapidly like Kilonovi. And here how you waste a lot of big uh, mirror telescope time. So when, uh, when then you do that for the, um, in the Jupyter notebook this afternoon, you will see that you have some of the metrics that are within the alert packets, the ZTF issues that can help you with that because the pipeline automatically does a cross match with all the known moving objects on top of using maybe a minimum time uh, difference requirement to call your transient a genuine uh, good candidate to, account, uh, to keep into account. Uh, oh yeah, and also you might see that asteroids may have an elongated shape. So even if they're slowly moving, they are moving during your exposure. So the uh, result will not be a symmetric uh, source, but an elongated or asymmetric one. You want to remove stars if you're looking for extra galactic transits. So you do some clever cross matches, use Gaia, or you use even deeper catalogs to try make sure as much as possible that you're not observing a galactic source thinking that it is extra galactic. Things are easy for bright sources, are less easy for uh, dimmer sources, of course. And then you have to be careful to other spurious effects, just spikes from very bright sources that you can see like in this example from GWST that also sometimes uh, may look like genuine transient, uh, but they are not. And stars vary. Stars are very variable in many cases, not just in binary systems. Uh, of course, then you have CVs, uh, you have cataclysmic variables, uh, but, um, but, but also um, eclipsing systems, you couldn't remember the word, and uh, all type of variables are earlier, they will always appear in your stream. You have to be able to select them out. What's up? <laughs> yes. Uh, they might look like UFOs, don't they? 
But in fact, uh, actually, I'm also part of a project. I don't know if I told you, Michael, looking for ex um, extraterrestrial intelligence in ZTF data. Although what you're looking for in this case is not quite the moving object, but maybe a signal that appeared for just a fraction of a second in your detector, like if it was an optical laser pointing at you. This is the technique in which techno signatures are called, uh, are also searched for, uh, sought for in the radio. So we're trying to do the same in the optical. But yeah, so UFOs, um, it's not just UFOs. You basically may detect also satellites from uh, your war enemy. It's not a joke. Uh, there is a lot of talking also with big agencies, you know, about how astronomical data can be used or filtered out to uh, unveil or to not unveil some uh, secrets, obviously, that governments uh, want to keep for themselves, and rightfully so, for everyone's safety, I like to think. But let's stay in the peaceful realm of cosmic explosions and the nuclear bombs, much more powerful than the ones we have on Earth such as, once again, supernovae. With all our pipelines, we can find a ton of supernovae in ZTF data. But we don't want them uh, if you're searching for a kilonova. So you also have to remove all this slow, relatively slow transients. You can put a filter on your duration for the transient, so the time between the first and the last um, detection in your stream or you can have your threshold for, um, for the rise time or fade time. You really have to tailor that to your science case. And once again, maybe you can use machine learning to uh, help you with that. Uh, this was not a lot, but already these are quite a few steps. And if you make them a module in your pipeline, it's not always talking about a couple of lines. Some of these can actually take dozen or hundreds if you're a poor coder like me. Um, but it's not the, the end of the story. You also want, and I have to read the list every time, and it, trust me, there's so much more, but you have to account for cosmic rays. So these charged particles that hit the detector, they look like a transient, and they might even look like an astronomical transient after uh, the image is convolved for image subtraction, although in the raw image, maybe you see just one or two pixels that are illuminated by the cosmic ray. You have crosstalk, uh, which can happen when you have bright sources. This is uh, due to electronic effect um, um, and how that propagates between different detectors uh, or these amplifiers, I should say, within uh, the CCD. So depending on the detector you're using, you may have crosstalk or a whole bunch of different effects uh, that are uh, maybe even reflections from within the instrument that may look like new sources. You have to be very aware of how your instrument behaves if you want to dig into this type of uh, region of the parameter space. And then you have bad photometry, not because you're a bad scientist, but it's not easy to have high quality, precise photometry. And I'm pretty sure many of you already faced this problem during your PhD. But then you don't have just problems. You also have ast uh, real sources, astrophysical sources that are just fooling you uh, to think they are of a certain class while they belong to a different class. They are e that is interesting to a different kind of astronomer. This is also why it's actually good, uh, just a small recommendation, maybe it's obvious to you all, but make friends. Make friends that work on different fields. Uh, perhaps you can mine your data set, hand them over. What you find that for you is not precious, but it's good for them. Be in their paper, learn something new, expand collaboration. It's only, uh, only good for you. Keep always in, that in mind, I think it's, it's a healthy practice. This can include uh, galactic uh, uh, M dwarf flares. So M dwarfs, these cool, low massive stars like to uh, emit very bright and short lived flares. You can have CVs, as I mentioned before, shock breakouts. AGNs are quite a contaminant, especially during 
uh, some minor flares that also appear red in color. So they could be kilonova, maybe, maybe not. Uh, and asteroids, especially those that are in stationary uh, points of the orbit, uh, these have fooled us many times and there is little you can do other than wait a bit longer or get another telescope to get extra photometry before you trigger CAC or VLT if you want to be extra sure that a fast transient is indeed a genuine transient uh, and not a moving object. But also, uh, you know, it, it, so it's easy to just uh, go with our gospel of being inclusive, being open in, uh, in our, I uh, guess, community. But we have to do that also scientifically with our data. Be open to new problems. Be open to something new that maybe is juicy and uh, maybe is worth follow up and understanding better, even if it's not exactly what you're looking for. And uh, I'll give you an example of that in a, in a few minutes. So my takeaway here, do your best to minimize the number of candidates that you have of things to look at because you've got a PhD to complete. You don't want to spend your life like me looking at 10,000 or more uh, probably like process stamps to, to find the one interesting source. You want the computer to do that for you. But at the same time, make sure your favorite sources would pass the cut and, uh, um, and be open to good surprises, not just problems. So here comes the part of candidate betting. Uh, when you have a short list of candidates, again, you can have some AI doing that for you and now it's happening. You can then trigger follow-up automatically with that. But typically, it's not bad to have one or more humans in the loop that can really look at all the information at hand, including uh, the quality that um, this, uh, the source detection has. Even if it passed all the automatic steps, sometimes our eye is good enough to see where the machine uh, couldn't quite help you discriminate between good, worthy of follow-up or not. Plus contextual information such as uh, galactic latitude, it's something you want to look at. Obviously, the closer you are to the plane, the easier it is that you come across galactic um, star flares, for example. And uh, archival information. You want to go look. Is this source been detected in the past ever? Does it have an X-ray counterpart? Does it have a radio counterpart? EGNs have that a lot. What are the colors in Wise? Can that tell me the type of uh, host it has and the type of uh, AGN or nucleus that it has, and so on and so forth. That's why you have some nice portals like Sky Portal, the one that Michael and others here have worked so much on to get all this information in one place and minimize the time and the effort you spend in doing the vetting. And then make sure you report whatever you find. I think the culture has moved more and more towards publicly announcing what you find as soon as possible. It's good for you to get credit. This is, you know, will remain. It's published as a DOI at some point. And uh, it's also good because you may not be able to do all the follow-up that you need on your own, even if you are in a team with a lot of resources. So if you want to get science done, announce as much as you can of what you find in a descriptive manner. And then follow-up has to be tailored to the type of source you're exploring, the type of information you need. Time on big telescopes is very limited, is very competitive to get. So I guess with time, you will learn better and better how to send only the most promising candidates to bigger telescope perhaps, and uh, maybe collect resources, maybe with network of smaller telescopes such as uh, Turbo or, or others that uh, will help you with a combination of photometry and spectroscopy and multi-wavelength follow-up to understand what's really most interesting for you. All right, so let's get a bit interactive or I'm gonna lose you all, I'm pretty sure. This is you know, a real-time event. You can see that the x-axis here in the plot is in days ago from a lot of days ago. So just ignore that. It's just an example I wanted to to collect to show you, okay? 
let's pretend it's real time. But you can still see, you know, it's days ago, but how, how long has this source been bright for? Like four days, three days, four days, something like that. Uh, this is copied and pasted from a portal. Again, sorry for the choice of color, but uh, these are red points, which are R band photometries, this one, this one, and this one. So the source is red in color. The SCD is tilted toward bright and is brighter at render wavelengths. And the G band are the other points. And you have upper limits before. So you know this source was not bright in the nights before. And then at the top, you have more information. You have the posted stamp around the detection in the new image, reference image, image subtraction. Looks pretty symmetric to me. And then you have archival images from SDSS, the Sloan um, um, Sky Survey and uh, PanStars. And you can see it's kind of messy, the environment around, um, around your, uh, around the source in archival images. We can tell you some. So say we're searching for Kilonovi, okay? This is our science case. Who here of you would trigger, well, we need a pretty big telescope to observe this, right? Because it's about magnitude 19.5, 20. You need at least a five meter diameter mirror to get good spectroscopy. It starts to be expensive, okay? So let's say we want to trigger the 200 inch telescope at Palomar. That's good enough. Uh, who in the room would trigger on this source? Okay, if none of you does, I'm gonna question you why you would not. Thomas, why would you not? Okay, so Tomas, uh, I'm repeating for people online. Tomas says that he would be looking for a host galaxy associated with the transient in the, in the vicinity. That's an excellent point, but let me debunk it pretty quickly. You see how truly messy things are in the archival image. I'm pretty sure that when you have so many sources and kind of a fussy uh, sort of background, this is not because you don't have a host, but it's, it's because you can't see the whole extent of the host galaxy. So some, this could actually be such a good candidate because it's a, in a fairly linear by galaxy. You don't know how, how nearby. So yes, you need to find a host, but big takeaway, just make sure you look at the context as a whole, zoom out. Okay, uh, it sounds trivial, but even within our collaboration, this is an ongoing conversation. We always have to renew and repeat, especially to new members and new students that join our project. Now, um, anyone else would tell me why they would not trigger on this one? Or, okay, has anyone changed their mind? Would anyone trigger? It's red, it's fast, maybe it's nearby in a host. I don't know what the answer is, but I can explain some of the things maybe that I'm thinking about. Okay. Um, so can I ask you to come closer to the microphone so I don't have to repeat everything? If you do. Yes. Okay. Sorry, I'm all plugged in. Otherwise, I would bring okay. it. Okay. Oh, man. So <laughs> I really appreciate this. Yeah. Um, some things I was looking at. So I'm not as familiar with Pilonova like hers, but from your presentation and looking online, I see that they sort of do start at peakish and then go down so the non-detections to me at first like was sort of throwing a red flag i was like oh well, maybe we should have seen some flux before then but maybe that's actually a good thing like if you said an asteroid sort of because it's moving you get some of the flux and then mm -hmm. all of and then at the maximum and then less of the flux again mm -hmm. that would say to me there's probably more of a symmetrical at least sort of like like her so that would maybe rule out hopefully more of an asteroid for me so now i'm sort of leaning more toward triggering on it, but uh, I, I don't know. Someone, thank you. Someone's already losing their religion and uh, embracing new confession. Anyone else change their mind? 
Okay, another person changed their mind. Michael, would you trigger on it? Okay, uh, I'm pretty confident it's, no, I'm not confident actually, I don't remember. But I can tell you the declination, not in galactic coordinates, but uh, it's 12. Is that about 41.12 array in deck? What's at 41.12? M31. So, unfortunately for Tomas, sorry not to put you too much on the spot, just enough, but uh, there was a host, but there is a problem with the host. It's a ginormous galaxy in our neighborhood which means that if you remember the parameter space I showed you at the very beginning, this is likely a nova. So if you do the math, you take the peak luminosity and uh, you place it at the distance of M31, then you get an absolute luminosity of about minus eight. Minus eight is exactly where you would expect nova to be. Can kilo nova be that faint? Maybe but you truly would expect them more like at minus 11 up. So in this case, we're leaning more towards non-triggering because it's pretty common to see Nova in M31. Um, also, why is it red? If it's in, a, and if it's a Nova, Nova are not that red typically, extinction. So the host, we're seeing it kind of through, uh, we're seeing the transient, through a veil maybe of dust and gas. And that makes it look redder than if it was say within our own galaxy and near next to us, or say in the very outskirt of the, of the host. Another example, here I put more information, including uh, uh, what Michael wanted. So the galactic latitude, so the separation between the galactic plate and this source is about 79 degrees is a lot, okay, it's almost as high as it can get. You have the signs, the reference image, and the difference there. You know that the extinction is very low. So if you see some reddening, it's not extinction within our own galaxy. And this is the photometry you see. At the top, the top point, the yellow one is I band, is the reddest. Then you have R band in the middle over here here, if I can use my cursor, and then G band. And then you have another R band data point two days after. Uh, host, no host, probably no host. Who would trigger on this? Michael would trigger on this. So let's pretend you're at Caltech. You have a lot of telescope time. Would you trigger on this? Why? <laughs> well, you still have to use it wisely, otherwise they fire you. <laughs> so it's red. What the, was the second thing you said? It's only two days. We actually don't know much more about it. Uh, what else can why it's interesting that it's red, even if I don't see a host? The answer is not that trivial. The answer is that synchrotron radiation in the optical is, um, so the, the, the spectral energy distribution has, uh, um, is tilted again towards the, the redder bands being brighter. So this is how the, how the index behaves. So, what generates synchrotron radiation? Relativistic processes. Maybe this is an afterglow. And the fact that we don't have uh, a, an obvious host make it unlikely to be a kilonova, but maybe it's an afterglow, who knows? Let's get some more information. This is the same source. I'm just pulling all the data, private and public together. You have a rise. Uh, that's not what we typically observe in afterglows. And also you see some uh, maybe flattening of the light curve, but still the color remains probably red. Who would trigger on this? 
the uniformity of your answer is concerning to me. <laughs> Think out of the box. Or if you're not triggering Keck, what would you trigger? Exactly. That's what we did. So maybe you want to trigger a telescope that perhaps you know is not a 10 meter telescope and you go interrupt other people doing their job. But first you want to make sure about how this trend is behaving. Is it actually fast or not? It's kind of hard for me to tell, to be honest. What's the actual color? At the end, I have just one data point and here I've got pretty large error bars in the one to the last epoch. I'm not that confident, I must say. So what I would do is perhaps call down early and get a Liverpool telescope on it. So photometry maybe with smaller telescope, that's a good idea. Make friends with people who have availability of these telescopes. You can do great science. Or another idea, what other method we can use even before triggering Keck? What else can we trigger? SCDM, so maybe you can have a low resolution spectroscopy in the optical, uh, although it's already 20 magnitude. Probably uh, Jesper Solomar will be mad because it's not the best use of a smaller telescope, unfortunately. You can get photometry, yes, even with an instrument that is mainly designed for spectroscopy, but you can think multi-wavelength. Go check for x-rays, go check for radio. If your idea that maybe there is some relativistic stuff going on, that maybe has a signature at other wavelengths. Again, synchrotron, which is right from uh, the gamma rays all the way to the radio, although with a very uh, uneven, uh, not continuous shape. We can go into the theory of it another day. But again, there is a rise time. That's so weird. I have no idea what it is. So, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, this is a bit more contextual information. There, there is maybe a galaxy in archival images nearby. That one was at redshift 1.2, but at that redshift, the separation would have been huge. So probably unlikely relate, um, associated with that source. So this is what happened. Uh, this is a screenshot from our Slack conversation of our collaboration. Uh, for the most romantic of you, this was Valentine's Day last year. And instead of going out with our um, beloved ones, we were at the computer trying to do science. I get excited very easily. That was not probably something too exciting, but the telescope has been down, the, the instrument has been down for weeks. Engineers work during the weekend to make it up and running again. And that was the first source that the ZTFRS pipeline identified after these changes, after these changes in instrumentation and telescope being back online. Michael gets very excited very quickly too. He just put a wow, not very quantitative, but it, it helped us uh, put some energy in there. Now, my personal uh, take is that it's probably an afterglow. It's red, it's fast, but hey, caught on the rise. Uh, the only other cases that I saw that was like an afterglow in 96 that actually became a nature paper at some point. Dan Perley was on the, uh, on, the, on the call and he has access to Liverpool Telescope, LT. So, Exactly, this is what we did for this source. I don't know if you knew the answer, but uh, that's typically a good idea. Uh, so thank you to Dan, that's also something nice to do. We report to the source immediately. Now check the difference in the timestamp between the, the identification, 11.05, and the time I reported on the uh, transient name server, and we're preparing a note for the community was less than, what, 15 minutes. And we triggered also a target of opportunity with Gemini, so an eight meter telescope, because actually this was so odd with the right time that we really want to get photometry. So do it quickly, 
Do it as well as you can with the resources you have. Share information with the community. And that turned out to be extremely important. So I don't have a plot here uh, for the multi-wavelength follow-up, but you can see that um, less than a day, or maybe a bit more than a day from the ZTFRS discovery, there was an X-ray <laughs> detection. The X-ray was extremely bright, meaning that even with nicer, so these are relatively small aperture sort of um, instrument, you get a lot of photos, which is not typically what happens. What's crazy though, is that then we got um, spectroscopy that allowed us to give a redshift to the source. And the redshift you can see at the top of the plot is about 1.2. So uh, a couple of comments. 1.2 is really similar to the value I said earlier. Remember from the Slack conversation. Probably actually that was a group of galaxies all at the same redshift in the surrounding region. Although that was not the right um, host, it was at the right redshift. And uh, second, if a source is really bright in the X-rays, what is that that redshift is intrinsically extremely luminous. In fact, it turned out to be one of the three most lu intrinsically luminous in terms of uh, equivalent isotropic luminosity in the X-rays ever found. And it turned out to be the brightest radio millimeter extragalactic source ever found. So a lot of the most are like a very special source. And not many of you said that they would trigger on it. I'm very disappointed. That's why I keep saying, be open to surprises. And this is what we observed in the optical. So weird became weirder. You can see there is the optical initial fast transient that we spotted when it was still decaying. And then in uh, uh, our band, which is here highlighted by this uh, Gaussian process um, um, shaded region, the black hole became flat and it was red, it became blue. This uh, makes no sense. But at least it did it. now it does, but at the time it made no sense to us. Because typically things are hot and blue and become cool and red. Here it was the opposite. So how do we explain it? What we think uh, were witnesses, uh, and it took quite a bit of time and uh, brainstorming to diagnose it is we are witnessing a jetted or relativistic tidal disruption event. Forget kilonovae, forget stellar explosions into a normal gamma ray burst. What we think happened is that a star approached a supermassive black holes, probably um, tens or hundreds, hundreds of times the mass of the sun, and it got, and the tidal forces completely shred apart, uh, tore apart the star. And in the process, uh, not only we could see a bright flare in the optical, as we see quite routinely now with ZTF, tidal disruption flares are not commonly observed in the optical, but our relativistic jet was also launched. And now you can wonder, What's, what's new with it? It's something we, we always see in gamma ray bursts. Why not in TDEs? Maybe the reason why we don't see many of those in TDEs is because we're not aligned well with the beam, right, of relativistic material. Well, it turns out that that's not, like this geometric correction is not enough to justify what we observe. What we really need is to cut down the rate of um, in which these events are formed at all. So in particular, we found that uh, about 1% of TDEs, of tidal disruption events, have jets at all. And this, again, thanks to the very regular monitoring with ZTF. And uh, this scenario in which we have a relativistic jet and then an outflow that is probably more isotropic and bluer and hotter justifies the transition 
from the fast red trains in to the blue plateau. Do we have a uh, time for a quick look at the future before moving to the next topic? Okay, I'll be pretty, I'll, I'll go pretty quickly here. So for now, I'm going to stop a bit talking about ZTF. What's next? A lot of projects are next. I'm just going to focus on a couple of my favorite ones or ones I'm uh, a bit more involved in. One is Vera Rubin Observatory that Michael has already introduced. It's being uh, built in uh, Cerro Pachon. Chile, and it is big. It's a big bucket for photos. This is a, a photo. You can see uh, workers up here that are fixing up the mirror mount. Okay. So match up state of the art detectors, a big mirror, a huge field of view. You have a great survey machine to really probe the depth of the universe. And this is what more or less every point in the sky outside our own galaxy will look like after 10 years of survey will be done and the images taken at the same region of sky will be stuck together. This is how rich a view of the southern sky, about 18,000 square degree of the uh, southern sky will look like. And the field of view, as I was saying, is huge. It's about 10 square degrees. It's not ZTF, but 10 square degrees. It's great for serving the sky and to do gravitational wave follow up. And why not to find kilonovae? So, Michael, myself, a bunch of others in our team have tried to estimate how many kilonovae are probably going to be there in Rubin data. And the answer is more than 300, very likely. But how many will we be able to recognize as fast transit to actually make discovery? Probably just a few several to a few dozens. So let's keep developing algorithms to be e effective in uh, finding kilonovae or whatever your favorite transients are in Rubin survey data when it comes online. And surely with the wide field of view, it will be fun to do active follow-up of gravitational wave events or other type of multi-messenger source. Rubin is gonna start soon. These pictures were taken late last year, I think. The dome is basically complete. The survey should start uh, in early 2025. So probably by the end of uh, uh, the PhD for many of you. Oh, and uh, here I'm just gonna wear for a moment the hat of uh, um, TVS, uh, Transient Variable Star Science Collaboration Co-Chair. So there are several collaborations within broader Rubin collaboration. There is one specifically for transit and variable stars, transients and variable stars. If you want to get involved, come talk to me. The bar is pretty low. Just make sure that your, um, uh, your institution has uh, data rights. If you're in the US, you're fine, or in Chile. Otherwise you have to dig a bit deeper. There are already more than 500 people involved. So come become one of us. And looking even further ahead, one of the next flagship missions of NASA is called the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. Field of view is just a fraction of a square degree. So it's not Rubin, but it's in space. This is how large the field of view is compared to Hubble, which is just the square uh, in the middle of the image. And it will be very sensitive in the infrared. Once again, perfect if you're interested in, uh, uh, in kilonovae or particularly high redshift distant transit. And in this plot, we're just putting together some models for kilonovae. The, um, I think the distance of this one is one gigaparsec. So it's like GW1717, but placed much further away. ZTF sensitivity is this uh, dotted line at the top and Rubin will be this dash, like very thick dash line. We'll barely manage to catch um, the very peak of the kilonova. With Roman, if we use one hour exposure time, so very long, can really go down to back to 28, very deep. And in the infrared, uh, here highlighted uh, with um, solid lines, lacquers are brighter and longer lived than in the optic. So, 
as they always say, future is bright. A lot of new toys are coming online. A lot will rely on alerts. So if you learn now how to mine alerts for fast transients or whatever transient you want um, to study, then you will be ready for the future, for uh, all future service. And I will conclude just summarizing a few takeaway points. Uh, these fast transients are typically hard to find, but they can hide uh, quite interesting physics um, with uh, a lot of applications to it. Whitefield survey with high cadence and uh, regular observing strategies can open new discovery spaces. They are up for grabs, or they're for you to go and explore them with your favorite algorithm. Borrow from someone else, or better yet, design your own. Machine learning, no machine learning, just make sure it works. And uh, finally, discovery happens when you recognize, share the discovery you make, you study it, and you do some science. Without any of this, probably the work you do is going to be incomplete, but uh, I think you can really do something great with everything uh, you're learning this year and with you. Upcoming, upcoming missions and projects. And I will stop here for today. Of course, Igor is here all week, so. And yeah, maybe more for people online. Yeah, also for the people online. We'll be able to take a break and so on. I can also write on Slack in case awesome. that there are uh, asynchronous yeah. questions. So any any quick ones? Otherwise, okay. Thank you, Igor. That was excellent. Thank you. Okay. So next, yeah, the switch. Oh.